Are you a policymaker? Are you looking for new solutions in your region? Are you interested in learning from other European regions facing similar challenges? With Interreg Europe, you can develop your interregional cooperation project and get co-financing from the European Union. You can team up with other regions in Europe, exchange your experience and improve your regional development policies. At Interreg Europe, we help regions from across Europe to develop and deliver better policies by sharing solutions. You can work on any topic of the EU policy agenda by making Europe greener, smarter, more social, better connected, better governed, or closer to citizens. Our first call of project proposals will open on the 5th of April and close on the 31st of May. At midday, hurry up and get ready to submit your application. Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us for the first time. You picked the perfect moment to join. This is Europe Let's Cooperate, Interreg Europe's Interregional Cooperation Forum. And for the next hour and a half, we are going to be talking about our first call for project proposals in 2021-2027. Let's see how to get you ready for the call, shall we? A uh, couple of very quick housekeeping notes for those who might be just joining us. The session will be fully in English. If you would rather follow this in French, we have a side session with French translation or interpretation. Uh, keep this one open, mute the sound, but open, hop in on another tab on your browser and go to French interpretation session to get the audio track in French. Um, but as said, here on the main stage, it'll all be in English for this session. And preparing a new call, that is no easy task for that We've also brought in some reinforcement here in the studio. We've got a whole team working on the chat. We've got some new speakers on the stage. So let's go and meet our chat team at first. Uh, chat team, over to you. Thank you, Mia. Hello, everybody. There's a full team of officers here ready to take your questions on Slido. We're really looking forward to discovering what topics you want to answer. And uh, yeah, don't hesitate, ask all your questions and we'll be glad to reply. And welcome also from my side, uh, a little practicalities that Mia was mentioning. Uh, if you want to leave uh, a comment, please uh, leave your comment or um, information about your project ideas in the chat which is on the right-hand side of your screen. And for our polls, and we prepared quite a number of them, head to Slido. So indeed, uh, we do have Slido running. The chat has been going crazy. I've seen a lot of people share their ideas for projects, the kind of partners they're looking for, um, what type of cooperation might be needed and so on. Keep those coming. But if you have questions about the first call, put those in Slido because we have a team working behind the scenes tirelessly helping you out, answering those questions. And we're going to take some of those live here as well. Um, let's meet the people who are going to be answering those questions, shall we? We've got our two heads of units, Nicolas Sanger and Petra Geithner from our Project and Platforms Unit and the Finance and Audit Unit. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Um, why don't we dive right into it? Because there's a lot of ground to cover. First call new program, new topics, a lot of new content. We already heard a lot of good tips, a lot of practical things this morning. Um, Petra, why don't we go through some of the basics just to recap. Interreg Europe, what is it, how it works in a nutshell, very briefly. <laughs> I think first of all, what, is, what we are very proud of, that we can say that there are plenty of opportunities. First of all, the budget has increased, if you compare it to the past programming period, 379 million euro are available for the new programming period. Second, um, there are six topics that this program will cover, so plenty of cooperation opportunities. The themes have increased. And then also all of the EU member states are covered by this program, plus Norway and Switzerland. And anyway, it's the first call, so this per se already means that there are plenty of opportunities. Plenty of opportunities, but who can participate? Well, I think we will develop this in a moment a little bit further, but uh, in a nutshell, as we are talking about improving policies, there are first of all the public authorities that are addressed by this programme. But then there are also bodies governed by public law that can participate because they might also have a role in designing and developing policies. And then last but not least, there are also the private non-profit bodies. I have to emphasize non-profit. And of course, if um, our viewers want to find out what's behind these concepts, I can only invite them to look at the program manual where the criteria, the definitions behind these terms are further developed. 
excellent. So as you heard, more opportunities than ever before. Petra also mentioned six new topics and I would like to know which of those are of interest to you. In addition to putting your questions in Slido, please let us know. We'll launch a poll and let us know which topic is of interest to you. We'll come back to the results in a little while. In the meantime, Nico, over to you. So we've covered the kind of basics, we know what Interreg Europe is made of, but um, tell us a little bit about the program objective. How does this work? Yes, thank you, Mia. Good morning to all. Also a pleasure uh, to see so many participants. Um, I would start by referring to the uh, official uh, European regulation, what they say for us. The, the regulations say that uh, Interreg Europe is there to improve regional development policies. I think you've heard this uh, already a lot this morning. And the regulation also uh, defines the way we should do it. It's mainly through exchange of experience, capacity building, based on the identification and transfer of good practices. So this may sound a bit theoretical. If you put it in uh, simple words, uh, that's what the colleagues say at the beginning of this session. It's very easy to understand, in fact. It's a program that helps policymakers involved in regional development to find inspiration, to find new solutions by exchanging their experience with other policymakers in Europe uh, so that they can uh, improve their policies at the end. But we do insist on the policies and policy work and all that policy improvements. You hear that mentioned a lot and policy instruments. So, so let's spend a little moment here. When we talk about policy instruments and, and when we talk about working with policymakers, what exactly are we talking about? Uh, this is an important question indeed because uh, the, the concept of policy instrument is, uh, is at the heart of what we are doing. This is perhaps a jargon of the program, this policy instrument, but uh, it's, uh, you can define it as a means of public intervention. Uh, so it can be, for instance, uh, a strategy developed by a local authority, or it can be a specific program, or it can be a law even. And of course, uh, in the vast majority of cases, they are developed by public authorities. And these uh, public interventions are implemented on the ground to try to solve uh, a specific challenge or to try to try to improve a specific situation on the territory. Maybe it is related to reducing the CO2 emissions in the regions. Maybe it is related to uh, improving the social inclusion of vulnerable groups, for instance. And I would add something, if you uh, may allow me, um, in this program, we have also uh, a specific focus on the program financed by the cohesion policy. We are ourselves a program of the cohesion policy, but the main uh, budget of this cohesion policy goes directly to investment in the regions uh, and in the member states. And these programs are called the investment for growth and jobs. Um, and if you pre prepare a project, you will not only have to define which main policies instruments you would, you would like to improve, but you will also have to ensure that at least one of these instruments is an investment for growth and jobs program. Indeed, very important points, but I do have to admit still a little bit abstract. So I think it would help to see this a little bit in context, how that actually works in a project. And we've got an example for you. Let's have a look at how one of our projects, Emopoly, has addressed this issue in their project. Welcome to our journey into alternative fuel mobility. We will guide you through Emopoly, a project co-funded by the Interreg Europe program to support the improvement of regional policy instruments with nine partners, more than 90 stakeholders, eight European countries, 54 months of joint work, and a budget of about 1.8 million euros. Today, there are many opportunities for low emission transport offered by alternative fuels what does that mean? Take a look. Emopoly aims to contribute to the effective dissemination of electric alternative fuels mobility by directly involving the managing authorities of regional policies linked to the structural funds in eight European countries. Italy, Slovenia, Greece, Belgium, Finland, Norway, Romania, and Latvia. The partners, led by the province of Brescia, have been working on several issues. Pricing and tolling policies in favor of electric vehicles, development of charging infrastructures powered by alternative sources, integration of charging infrastructures and charging hubs in spatial planning, purchase of alternative fuel vehicles in public transport, and promotion of electric mobility in fleets. All partners coordinated by BSC Regional Development Agency of Kron hosted and shared multiple regional and local experiences and good practices on alternative fuel mobility. 
through workshops, roundtable, field visit, and staff exchange. eMopoly. I hope this clarifies how the projects work, but we want this to be clear because this is really crucial. So let's see with the chat team if we've got any questions. Thank you, Mia. Yes, indeed, the Slido is very active with questions. Already some that I would put to Nico. Um, Nico, some of our participants are asking, what are the main differences between Interreg Europe and other Interreg programs? What would you have to say to that? Yeah. Yes, thanks for this question. It's, it's an important one because, uh, at least in the past, we were receiving a lot of questions from people coming from the cross-border program or transnational program. And I would insist that Interreg Europe is uh, very different from these other uh, Interreg programs. Uh, and it derives from what I've just said at the beginning on the objective, on the means. Uh, I would, of course, mention the geographical coverage because I think we are the only one covering uh, the, the whole EU territory plus Norway and Switzerland, but much more fundamentally, uh, because of the objective and the means, the first difference is that we are primarily dedicated to policy makers, to the organizations that are in charge of regional development policies. And the second main difference with other interreg is that we are primarily dedicated to capacity building. We are not a research program, we are not an investment program, we are really there to increase to increase the capacity of people and organizations. So some very clear, distinct, unique features. Um, Eilish, do we maybe have another question? Yes, absolutely. We also have a question. What do you mean exactly by improving regional development policies? Yes, <laughs> we, we are at the heart of the subject and I may need uh, 10 minutes now, I'm joking. Um, well, where to start? The, the first thing I would mention is the notion of regional. Uh, if you look at our documents, we are very open in the notion of region. You do not necessarily need to be a regional authority to come to Interreg Europe. We address policies that are relevant to regional development in general. So it can be at the municipal level, it can be at the county level, it can be at the region level, it can be even at the national level uh, in smaller countries, as long as it is relevant uh, to regional development uh, policies or regional development in general. And then the core notion, the core objective, how to improve regional development policies, there are many ways to do this. We provide some examples also in our program manual. I would invite you to check this. But it can be through many ways. It can be uh, by financing new projects, for instance, that you have discovered somewhere else. But it can be also in the way uh, you implement your policies, you change your selection criteria or you change the consultation process with the citizens, with the community. This is also another way uh, to make the public intervention more efficient. Or you can even change the strategy itself, uh, in, introduce a new chapter, introduce a new measure in your own uh, policy. Right. I hope I answer the question. Very good questions, very good answers. Thank you for those. Uh, we're going to take some more questions uh, throughout the session, so keep them coming. Very good first ones, and we want to see more of those. Keep the chat group busy. Eilis, let's take one more. Thanks, Mia. Um, Nico, you were talking about jobs and growth programs. Um, we have a question from Anna. Are ESF programs considered jobs and growth programs or only ERDF? So I think Anna is asking about the European Social Fund and the European Regional Development Fund here. Yes, I can confirm to Anna that this program, Investment for Jobs and Growth Program, they cover both uh, ERDF and ESF funding. So, uh, and you will see in our topics, by the way, that everything related to education, training, uh, are fully uh, eligible, fully possible in this program. All right, thank you for that. I do want to keep going on with the with the program because we have a lot of uh, additional points we want to share. We'll come back to the questions later on. Um, Nico, next question to you. Uh, Petra already mentioned the six topics. You see those right behind us here on the stage. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the topics that we're going to be working on in the 2021-2027 program? Yes, I think Petra has already mentioned that uh, it's becoming wider, this program, in terms of uh, coverage, uh, th thematic coverage. Um, the interesting element of this program is that, in fact, we have only one single priority dedicated to capacity building. And this allows Interreg Europe to focus on the whole range of priorities of the cohesion policy that you see reflected in this icon, in this smart, green, connected, social, citizens and governance. And... Uh, 
I cannot really go in the details of each of these. Uh, if you're interested to understand a bit better what kind of uh, subjects are possible behind these icons, I would invite you to check what we call in our jargon the specific objective that are in the regulation, but they are also in the terms of reference of our first call, they are also in the manual, and you will see much more concretely the kind of cooperation that can be financed. Emopoly, for instance, the subject we've just seen, would be Perf would perfectly fit under, under the green, the greener Europe. There is a specific objective on sustainable urban mobility. Uh, this could be uh, the kind of project we could also finance in the future. And I want to stop here for a little while because we have been asking uh, also our participants what they are interested in. We know six topics, more opportunities than ever before, all, all cohesion policy topics and so on. Uh, Petra, how does it look? What are our participants interested in? So our participants are mainly interested in green topics. 75% of those who participate in this latest poll that we had for you said that that's the topic of their interest, followed by SMART. So we go very closely with the objectives of uh, European Union. Uh, and then the third is social. So the question that Eilish just had a while ago uh, goes directly in line with that. Uh, Nico, when we were looking at the results right here, I saw you nodding, maybe a comment on, on how it's looking. Yes, because there is something I didn't really mention, uh, uh, is a concentration principle, as we call it, is that the strategy of the program is to allocate uh, a majority of funding on a certain number of subjects. To make it short, it's mainly under smarter and greener Europe and partly under more social Europe. And what is very interesting in the poll is that uh, most of the interest are under this 80%, although we are also a bottom-up uh, programmer, so it's really up to the regions to define their need and their topic. But I think it's very good news that uh, to see that there's a kind of convergence between the strategy defined by the member states and the commission and what we can see from the ground. Indeed. Uh, maybe one thing to note is that we were asking about the topic interest also in the registration and it was very much in line with the poll results. So we do have participants here today who are interested in all of the topics. Uh, a lot of them in green and smart, but in all of those topics. And we have some networking tools in the expo area that you can make use of during the afternoon to reach out to these people. So you can indeed make use of the opportunity that we are thousands of people here today and, and find those new partners for new cooperation. Um, moving on, next point. So we've got the topics covered. We kind of know what the program is doing. Nico, let's talk a little bit about activities. Can you tell us a little bit about the activities that are supported in our projects? Yes, of course, um, yeah. um, you've seen that the program is quite open uh, in terms of topic, uh, in terms of uh, objective. I would say to introduce the activities, that's perhaps where the program is more prescriptive mm -hmm. um, because we more or less define what is possible precisely. And it's, it's also a real difference between this program a lot and a lot of other EU programs. So our activities are dedicated to learning, very simply. And the vast majority of activities are learning by exchanging experiences. So you can see there, as we heard also today from Imopoli or from the colleagues, it's everything related to organizing workshops, uh, seminars, study trips, uh, peer reviews, why not? Really understanding each other through this kind of activities and identifying, uh, hopefully, some interesting practices that I could maybe adapt to my uh, context. But the program is also a bit more open uh, now to what we called learning by doing. Mm. Sometimes, you know, it's not only enough to travel, to meet, to visit places. Uh, before being able to improve your public intervention, you need to test before on, your, uh, on the ground to see if it works or not. Mm. So we have also this possibility for pilot actions, either at the start of the project or at midterm. Uh, maybe uh, they, I'm sure there will be certain questions on this. Uh, all this contributes to increase the capacity, uh, as I said earlier, of people and organization, not only in the partners that are in the project, but also in the stakeholder groups that need to be created uh, in each of the regions to move towards policy improvement. Yes. Um, so there's a lot of different types of activities and all that. And Petra, I want to bring you back into the discussion here. Uh, let's put this into a little bit of a frame. How does this work? How does the project implementation process go? I think it's important to mention that the project duration has been standardized. So the project duration is now fixed to four years for every project. 
and um, it's still divided into two phases. There's first of all the core phase, that's the, the heart of our project, it's the longest phase, it's, it covers the first um, three years. This phase about, is about exchange of experience, about the study visits, about learning among the partners. And we expect that at the end of these three years, the partners have actually identified opportunities to improve the policies um, they are addressing in the project and have achieved policy improvements. And then comes the second phase of one year, which is called the follow-up phase. And this phase is there to monitor then the effects of the policy improvements um, they have introduced. So the aim also of this follow-up phase is to continue exchanging among the partners um, and to see what happened in the individual regions in terms of policy change and um, still to exchange about it and maybe to take lessons from each other and to yeah, draw further conclusions from, from this. Yes, so a clear focus on, on, the, on the core stage and then additional opportunities afterwards. Uh, Nico, maybe a quick follow-up question on this, because especially for those who have been involved in our projects in the past, there's a lot of discussion about action plans and that's been a very important part of the project, but there's something new about these. Can you help us out and clarify this a little bit? Yes, it's, uh, it's indeed a new uh, approach that we have on action plan. Maybe I, I say a very quick word for those who do not know the program and they may wonder what is an action plan. An action plan is a document where the region, the partner from the region, they define one, two, three actions that they want to do in order to make sure that the learning they gain uh, from the exchange of experience is not lost and may lead to policy improvement in the region. So this was an obligation in the 2014-2020 uh, program. And uh, with what uh, Petra say now, when you look at the core phase, the core objective of the core phase is that regions manage to transform the learning into actions that they really improve certain aspects of their public interventions of their regional development policies. So it does not make sense to ask action plan from these regions who, sec who are successful after three years. Mm. In other words, the action plans will only be required from the regions that did not uh, manage to achieve policy improvement at the end of the three years. Uh, that's uh, something new and it makes also the things more flexible, we think, more e easier for the beneficiaries. The last thing I wanted to say is that you will have also, compared to the previous program, more flexibility between, between the two phases. First, it will be up to the project to define how they would like to organize the follow-up phase, the last year of the project. And they could also continue the exchange of experience. It's sometimes very interesting to learn from this improvement that happened in the region. Um, this is uh, uh, still another difference with uh, the previous program. Yes, so very good things. I'm hearing there's more flexibility, I'm hearing there's more opportunities, and all that sounds very good. Before we go deeper into the details, I just want to check if we have any more questions. I'll give you a little bit of time to think. If you haven't posted your question in Slido, do so right now, because um, you've seen what Emopoli is doing, you've met some of the other project lead partners if you've been with us since this morning. I want to give the floor to some of the lead partners to talk about their cooperation experience, and after that we're going to Take your questions. So basically, these cooperation programs give us the opportunity to interchange experience with other uh, regions that are facing the same difficulties or some similar difficulties that we are facing now. Um, we can learn from each other, but it is also important to know that sometimes we need to learn together because we share a common problematic. I think that it's always very good to, to collaborate uh, with with partners from out of your own safe context and, and especially in Europe. So one thing we can do is, is make better projects, work together, get to know each other. And that is a very good element to, to enhance the cohesion and, and also the resilience of our societies. The main idea, uh, as I see it, is to connect people and to exchange the experience. And this is something that uh, this is something that is really in, that, that we that we really enjoy. The most uh, common feedback that comes from the partners is that they are really impressed about the international network they that could develop with partners from all over Europe. That's always still for me the most 
a rewarding part of, of, of European cooperation to see partners that are really getting inspired and getting new ideas and, and want to try that out in their own region to see if that works. So I really encourage any region or any person who would like to take this uh, way to get part of an interregular project as this can enrich you, open your mind and help the region to find the great solution for you. I hope you made good use of the time to post your questions because we're going to start covering them now. Um, Eilish, what have you got? Thank you, Mia. Um, I think this mention of pilot actions definitely piqued people's curiosity. Um, Nico, we have some questions. How many pilot actions can be implemented in one project, one per region, perhaps? Also, question, are pilot actions voluntary or mandatory? Uh, thanks for this question. At least you have already answered to the first one. It's indeed a maximum uh, one per region during the whole lifetime of the project. Um, and um, we would also uh, insist on the fact that they are not at all compulsory. Um, we have a very, very successful project without any pilots. And pilots require some preparation time, especially if you, of course, um, propose them at the start. So um, I would, uh, yes, recommend um, the, the, the interested uh, applicants to be careful and to prepare them very carefully. Thank you, Nico. Um, we also have a question. Um, could you say a few words about the stakeholder group? Um, this is something that uh, our projects know has been very important. Um, what's the role of the stakeholder group in this new programming period? It's another important feature of the project, and indeed we didn't even show it on the on the slides. Uh, when you are working in policy making, you you don't do it alone. Uh, you really uh, need to involve a certain ecosystem, if I can use this word. So, for instance, if we are working on innovation policies, uh, you will have to have uh, maybe with you with the public authorities. You you may have to have the uh, innovation agency. You may have to have the chambers of commerce, the universities, the research institutes, the SMEs themselves even sometimes uh, and it's very important for the success of the project that these different stakeholders are also uh, involved in a way or another in the exchange of experience so they can bring their knowledge and they can also uh, learn from others and hopefully at the end implement uh, policy improvements. So there's an obligation for all participating regions to, to have this stakeholder group in their projects. All right, let's take one or two more, Eilish, if you've got something related to the activities, because then we will move on to talk about uh, project finances. So, two more. Thanks, Mia. Uh, we have an interesting question here about action plans, Nico. Um, one of the participants is wondering, how can we know at the application stage if we need to plan for an action plan or not? This is indeed a, a very important question because um, you will only know hopefully after two, three years or in the last year of the project if you finally manage to do this uh, policy improvement or to change uh, your public interventions in your region. Uh, so nobody can know for sure what's going to happen. Uh, what I would like to say on this is that our approach to action plan is, is very, very light. Um, it will be even, for those who know our system, it will be even integrated in the progress report. So you don't need necessarily a lot of energy, a lot of external expertise uh, to develop uh, this action plan. Um, but you have to be ready in case you do not achieve your objective after three years. You will be ready to think a bit more, to put down uh, a few measures on paper uh, so, what we call the action plan, yes. And one final one, if you've got something. Uh, yeah, we have lots of questions here. Um, someone is asking, what about the dissemination and communication activities? This is something that hasn't been mentioned yet. Is it still possible in Interreg Europe projects? Yes, they are. I'm not the best person, I have to say. <laughs> I should turn to my uh, communication colleagues. Um, but uh, we had a lot of discussion. It's an interesting question because we had a lot of discussion with other interact programs to harmonize our approach. But we are one of the programs which really put forward still the communication activities. They are important not only 
uh, within your partnership uh, uh, to understand each other, to uh, reach your stakeholder in a proper way, to commit them to the project. But of course, they are also very important because you have a kind of duty of promoting your project when you're financed uh, by European money. You really need also to communicate externally. And everything you produce also in terms of uh, communication are quite important for us uh, at program level. It helps us to uh, communicate on the program and uh, make people understand what we are doing and the achievement of this program. So yes, communication activities are welcome. All right, let's stop there with the questions for now. Keep them coming. As said, we do have a whole team working behind the scenes answering them also in Slido. So the ones that we don't cover here, keep an eye on Slido, you might get an answer there. Um, I want to move to another very important part of projects, which is how they're funded. Uh, for that, I'm glad to have you, Petra, here with us. Um, let's let's go into the financing. Let's start with the, with the cost categories and how that works. What, what do we actually fund? So first of all, um, let me highlight that there are preparation costs. So every um, successful project will be automatically re um, awarded a lump sum of 17,500 um, euro. Then um, the budget line staff cost is really the most important budget line for the type of projects that we are having because uh, exchange of experience, it's above all staff intensive. So um, here um, our partner states decided to further simplify and to find a good balance between a simple approach to the, the staff cost budget and at the same time um, staying close to the real cost. So here only one option is now um, retained from the regulation for the reporting of staff cost and uh, that's the so-called fixed percentage option. So what partners need to do is they have to estimate um, how many staff members will be involved, at what percentage they will involve these staff members, and then they simply um, estimate the gross employment cost for these staff members, multiply it by the percentage representing their expected um, involvement, and then they have their staff budget. And then, of course, um, to further simplify, the partner states also decided to um, introduce um, two flat rates. For the office costs, there is still, like in the past, the 15% flat rate. So um, this, I think, our partners that have uh, participated in the past are already very much used to. Um, and then the new um, flat rate that has been introduced is a travel and accommodation cost flat rate. Um, it's also 15% and it's also based on the staff costs. Um, and we hope that this will also further simplify and that many, many partners will really go for this option um, because um, for the travel um, flat rate, there is still a real cost option. However, we really expect only partners to go for this in very exceptional cases. I rather see here maybe the partner from outermost regions or other peripheral areas um, of Europe to go for it. But for all others, we really hope that um, they will find this flat rate of 15% for travel costs attractive and will go for this option. Let me also underline that the choice here is on partner level, so it's not a project has to decide on it, but it's per partner. Then um, for external expertise and equipment, uh, we didn't standardize anything because that's really where each project uh, has to decide um, depending on the activities they want to carry out, what they shall budget um, here. And then there is a new budget line that has been added at the end of the list. That's the infrastructure and works budget line. But here I clearly have to first of all underline that this is only for pilot actions. And second, also, that we expect this to play only a very marginal role, even in pilot actions. We don't expect big investments here. It's just that sometimes um, when um, there is a purchase of an equipment item within a pilot action, it requires some small works or some additional building material um, um, in relation to this equipment item. And that then now can be budgeted under this budget line. But Please, I want to immediately emphasize here that this um, will only play a very marginal role and only for pilot actions only. Yes. Two questions before we continue. I'm going to guess what our audience is going to ask anyway, so I'll just kind of jump to it. Um, can you give me an example of a typical project budget? How much would that be? Let's put it in context a bit. Well, what we expect is, um, what we assume is that uh, the average budget will be between 1 and 2 million euro ERDF, which means then in terms of total cost between 1.2 and 2.4 million euro. 
it's of course a very wide span. It depends very much um, how many partners there are in the partnership, um, if they will opt for a pilot action or not. Um, this will very much influence um, the budget amount. Um, what we expect to see in reality is that I think the majority of the projects will be in a budget range between 1.7 to 2 million euro. Um, yeah. And another see. question that would come for sure, so let's just get to it. Co-funding, how is that going to work? Co-financing, how does it give us an overview? Yeah, um, the partner states decided to go for the maximum co-financing rate allowed by the regulation for the public um, authorities and the uh, bodies governed by public law. So 80% will be co-financed um, by the program for these um, authorities. For the non-profit private part. Uh, uh, private uh, bodies in line also with the whole program rational will have a slightly lower co-financing rate it's um, 70 percent and Norwegian partners will also be granted funding from the program Norwegian funding from the program and the rate here will be 50 percent for Swiss partners um, the funding is not provided by the program directly but Swiss partners would have to get in touch directly with the Swiss national contact point and there they can get further information about the funding opportunities there but there are also funding opportunities for Swiss partners. Great. Thank you, Petra. I think that gives a good overview of the, of the basics of the financing, but I'm sure there are some questions. So chat corner, Eilish, how is it looking? Thanks, Mia. Um, Petra, first of all, you spoke about the option of a flat rate for travel costs. Um, people asking, is this obligatory? And could you tell us where does the 15% come from? Okay, I think, um, yeah, to answer to this question, um, I would like to put forward three points. First of all, we didn't invent the 15%. It comes directly from the regulation. The regulation gives this op uh, option now to programmes to propose 15% um, flat rate to the projects. Um, then um, the second is also that our experience is that um, when it comes to reporting expenditure, a lot of small errors happened on this budget line. However, however with a very, very minor financial impact. A metro ticket um, that um, the machine didn't give back when you stamp it, for example, that was then missing and still someone wanted to report it. One euro correction, things like this. And we thought this is really something where we can simplify further. And um, that's where also then we thought that this flat rate is very attractive. And the third point, most important, is also that we didn't just take the flat rate from the regulation, but we even looked at our own statistics, what our projects um, have actually um, budgeted for travel and reported under um, travel. And here we could see that um, for all partner states, um, this is of high interest. Um, all of them were close to 15% or just below, or quite below even 15%. Um, so I can only encourage um, all partners to seriously consider this um, flat rate and also the simplification potential in terms of internal administration. Everything you save on administration, you gain on energy and time to concentrate on your project activities. Okay, so an option but an attractive option. Um, moving back to pilots, Petra, um, some of our participants are wondering uh, what is the usual budget for a pilot action? Is it financed through the overall project budget? Could you say a few more words about that, please? Yeah, of course, if um, project partners intend to have a pilot action from the very beginning of the project, they need to budget it from the very beginning. They need to split the pilot um, um, across the budget lines that we have previously um, presented. Um, and um, the budget we expect um, per pilot action is between 40 and 120,000 euro. I think many of the pilots that we have seen in this period were around between 50 and 70,000 euro. Maybe now that it's possible to have pilots from the beginning, the budget dedicated to it will be slightly bigger. So we are very curious to see what our projects will propose. Excellent. Let's take one more and then talk more about partnerships. One more finance question. Okay. Um, we have a person asking, can we request funds for the exchange of experience in phase two or will there be a fixed lump sum applied? Also, if the need for an action plan emerges later, will the partner have to apply for additional funds to finance its development? 
Um, so the um, budget for phase one and phase two, it's up to the partners, to the projects to um, budget it. Um, there is no um, lump sum or anything predefined coming from our side. Um, well, those of you that have been with us in the past might know that we had introduced and tried a lump sum. However, we think that um, in this period it makes less sense because we also expect to have more flexibility between the two phases and a lump sum only makes sense when you can standardize things. However, here we don't think this is the case. So we leave it up to the projects to um, um, yeah, come up with their own um, budget. Then for pilot actions, it will be possible also to introduce pilot actions at a later stage. Um, and then, of course, budget will have to be added. But I think this is something we don't need to discuss right now. It's important for them to know that they can propose pilots already from the beginning. And this has to be budgeted right now. If it's not the case, then the successful projects will learn later on um, if, um, how to add another pilot if they want to do it at a later stage. All right, more finance question will be covered in Slido, so keep an eye on that for more. But now let's add one more layer. People are going to start building their new partnerships and start thinking about new projects. What are the things that they should keep in mind? Um, let's go back to you, Nico, and let's talk a little bit about the requirements we have for the geographical coverage. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, we have been mentioning uh, quite often this morning that this program is unique due to its uh, geographical coverage, all EU uh, member states plus Norway and Switzerland. And uh, I think the Commission, also Ervin, mentioned this importance of mis mixing well advanced with uh, more advanced, uh, less advanced with more advanced regions. Sorry, this is a bit the cohesion put into practice. Um, all this uh, end up in a, in a specific requirement for this first call. Uh, that uh, the program has defined four areas, north, east, south and west. And the uh, obligation for the projects is to have at least one partner from each of this area. Uh, this may sound uh, quite demanding, uh, quite difficult. I would just mention that out of the 258 projects that are financed in this programming period that didn't have these requirements, more than two thirds already respect uh, this geographical coverage. And you have to know also that in the past, we received many, many partnerships that were primarily cross-border transnational and unfortunately failed because they were not really in the spirit uh, of Interreg Europe and this broad exchange of experience. Well, let's stay with the spirit of Interreg Europe here for a while. It's not just about the geographical coverage. We've been talking about the types of partners that can be, can be involved. We've talked about policies and that's not by accident. So what else should people keep in mind when it comes to the partnerships? Yes, uh, we, we come now to the nature of the partners. Uh, Petra was mentioning at the beginning who is eligible in terms of uh, status. We would like to come now to uh, who is our pri primary target group, the, the core target group of this program. And the 20 years of cooperation that we uh, build on, the 20 years of experience, show us that there is a core element in this program. If you want to be serious with this ambitious objective of improving regional development policies, at the end of the day, you need to have the policymakers, the authorities that are in charge of these policies, you have to have them on board. Uh, and th this, the new requirements, uh, some new requirements derive from this uh, very important element. That's maybe the most important for the partnership. Um, in this new program and in the first call, for at least half of the policies instruments that the project would like to improve, the policy responsible authorities will need to come as a partner. So it's a very big difference with the past. And even when this is not the case, because there are situations where, for whatever reason, uh, the policy responsible authority cannot come, it will have to be involved as what we called uh, associated policy authorities. This is a new status that we have uh, created in the program. And what does it mean? Maybe a quick word on what it is an associated policy authority. It's an organization, an authority that is still described in the application form. You have a bit uh, of the contact details. It has, however, no budget, uh, so it's not considered as a, as a partner. Uh, but it needs to provide a declaration uh, so it's a kind of commitment at the application stage. And the last thing is that the program will also follow it up during the implementation of the project, follow up whether or not this uh, authority is really well involved, properly involved in the different project activities.
Uh, you said it yourself, this is a very important aspect. And I just want to stop here again for a little while, go back to our chat corner and see if we have any questions about the partnerships or eligibility, perhaps. Eilish. Thanks, Mia. Um, we have a question, Nico. What does it mean to be responsible for a policy instrument? Could you explain that, please? Yes, uh, this is another very important notion. Uh, we have explained a bit earlier what is a po regional development policy instrument. Now we come to the policy responsible authority. The definition is very simple. It's the authority that is in charge of developing and delivering this instrument on the ground. So maybe it's a bit specialized, but it, if I take the example of the investment for growth and jobs programs, for instance, officially there's a managing authority that is in charge of implementing this program. So you consider this managing authority as the policy responsible uh, authority. In some member states, there's even uh, intermediate bodies that implement part of this program. These intermediate bodies can be considered very often also as policy responsible uh, organization. But a, a more simple example, for instance, if I am the city of Rome and I'm uh, implementing the policy on the transport and uh, public transport, uh, the city of Rome is the policy responsible authority for uh, this um, uh, 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 public transport strategy or public transport policy. The last thing I wanted to say about this is that if you have any doubts on whether or not my organization is policy responsible authority, it will be at the end of the day, the partner states that will uh, confirm this or not. We cannot be aware of all the context in Europe. So uh, the national point of contact will also be important for you uh, if you have doubts on this, uh, on this notion. And a quick note about the national point of contact, because we do have a so-called country corners in the expo where you can meet many of these country mm. representatives. So if you do have any questions, go and check out the expo after this session and see if you can maybe talk to the representative from your country. Now, Eilish, let's take one more question from the chat. And, and I would also be keen to know how things are looking over on Slido in terms of polls. So Petra will come to you afterwards. So Eilish, question first. Thanks, Mia. Um, Nico, we have another question here. You said a few words about associated policy authority, but um, it's not so clear to some of our participants how these uh, authorities can be involved if they have no budget. Could you explain a bit more? Yes, maybe I could even pass a question to Petra. But, uh, yeah. Okay, maybe we come back to the term. It's called associated policy authority. It means this authority is associated to a partner, to a real partner. And it's this partner who could um, budget some costs, some travel costs for this associated policy authority under external expertise. So it's not eating up the flat rate. Let me underline it. Um, and that way, um, the associated policy authority can be also taken along when it comes to study visits or meetings. Um, so there is no budget as such, because also to keep it simple for these authorities to be involved. But there is a possibility for the partner that this authority is associated to, to budget a little cost, travel costs under external expertise and services. Excellent. Uh, Petra, very quickly, a question to you over to the chat. How are things looking? Are people still still looking for partners? Do they have other questions? Uh, what kind of poll responses have we received? Uh, give us a bit of, bit of an update. Yes, so in the meantime, as my colleagues were discussing how to prepare a project and what are some of the key features for it, uh, I launched a poll asking you how many of you are likely to submit your project application during our first call. And we see that quite a number of you, 30% of those who replied, are extremely likely to submit it and many of you are still considering it. Um, so uh, this is for the poll uh, when it comes to the added questions and the chat. It's very busy. People are exchanging their contacts, uh, links to their project ideas, uh, their contact details for further cooperation. And that's exactly what we want from this event. Back to you, Mia. All right, great. Let's then, if the chat is busy, if Slido is busy, Eilis, let's take one more question and then let's move on to the call details. Um, we have a question here. Are there associate partners in Interreg Europe projects? And if so, how many? Maybe I'd address that one to Nico. 
Yes, I hope I understood the question. Um, I think you need to go back to the requirements that I have explained a bit earlier. Um, let's take a project, a project of eight regions addressing eight policy instruments, in, uh, sorry for the jargon. In this uh, project, the minimum that you need to ensure is that for at least four of these policy instruments, the policy responsible authority is involved as partner. If you do that, you will go through the eligibility criteria, you will be able to submit your application. The remaining four could come as associated policy authority. The perfect situation is, of course, when all policy instruments uh, are represented by their policy authorities as partners, but we know that this is not always possible, depending on the country, on the context, on the administrative setting. Um, so, uh, the, it very much depends on how many regions manage uh, to come with their policy responsible authority. Otherwise, the other regions, they come with their uh, associated policy authority. All right. Thank you so much for the questions. Keep them coming. We will come back to them. Now, uh, we've talked about the program. We've talked about how the projects work. We've talked about who can be involved. We've even talked about money and financing and how all that works. Now, let's talk about the first call and... Uh, what the key dates are, what to keep in mind, how does it work? Petra, I'll leave this to you. Okay, I think those of us that joined already from the very beginning of this morning have seen our director opening the call. So the information is, for those that joined later, the call is open as of today. And the call is going to close on 31st of May and um, it was already highlighted, the closure is at 12 o'clock noon Paris time. Please pay attention to it. Don't submit in the last uh, minute. and. Um, make sure it's before 12 o'clock on 31st of May. Then the partner states also decided to reserve um, a maximum budget to this first call. It's 130 million euro. It's nevertheless a considerable budget um, based on our experience in the past. So there are also with this envelope still plenty of opportunities there. And all of the six topics are open. And if you wonder how you can apply, well, then um, uh, I would like to uh, mention that there is an online platform. It's called the Interreg Europe portal, um, where you um, can submit the application form. You fill it in there. You submit everything in the portal. Everything is fully online. Um, and, well, as it's always the case, uh, there are last fixes going on at the moment on the portal. So what we advise you to do already as of today, register already to our community on our website. Then you will read receive notification when the portal is definitely open. And in addition, um, as mentioned already, the application pack can already be downloaded from our website and everything is in there, the terms of reference, the program manual, and also the application form in Word. So you can start looking what is required from you and start filling. And then there shouldn't be any issue with the deadline of 31st of May. And we really look forward to seeing many applications. Exactly. The 31st of May might be coming faster than you think. The documents are already available. We'll put a link in the chat so you can find them there. Um, we already saw that quite a few of you are planning to apply, which is great. We look forward to those applications. Uh, we want to know also if you are ready to apply. We are here to help you, so um, what kind of support might you need? We've been running a poll on Slido. Petra, do we already have an update on how people feel about the actual application? Just the from the chat. Just a second. Uh, so uh, we have some more answers, uh, but it hasn't really changed that much. We still have about 40% of those who replied uh, extremely likely uh, to apply. Uh, and then uh, uh, another 30% uh, between three and four in the likelihood uh, of having their uh, project application ready with this first call. So we hope this 130 million euros uh, will be put to good use. All right, so to those people preparing their applications, uh, we do have some assistance available, but um, Petra, what are the tools and what kind of help do we provide for people working on their applications? I think the first tip is make really use of today. And I think Mia, I guess later on, you will explain further what's happening after this session. You mentioned already the country corners and so on. Um, and then um, there are plenty of online tools on our website. So I would really like to encourage you to register to the community. 
to go to our website and then to find out about the online tools that we are offering. There is a self-assessment tool to check the relevance of your proposal. Um, you can find um, and search partners. Um, you can post your project idea. And um, you will also be able from next week onwards to ask for JS feedback. So really go there. I think there's a lot um, of assistance you get, can get already from our website only. But of course, we don't leave it to our website only. We are also, re also offering further events during this call. And um, here, first of all, I would like to mention the Lead Applicant Seminar Week that we are organizing. Um, I think it's from, 20, from uh, 25th of April, the whole week. We have four sessions with different um, um, thematic focuses in these um, four sessions. And then also we are um, organizing almost weekly um, question and answer sessions where we will be able to answer questions coming directly from you, the applicants. Um, it's really based on the needs you have and we will provide the corresponding answers, hopefully. Yes, so we are indeed here to help you from the start or until the end of the of the call. We're going to be here not only in this session, but also for the rest of the afternoon. You will find Interreg Europe Corner in the expo area on Hopen, and you can go there. Nico and some other of our colleagues will be there to help you out with any questions. You can have a chat with them, you can have a video discussion with them, and they'll answer more of your questions. Um, we are still going to take some of your questions in this session, so keep posting those there in Slido. And... Uh, uh, we do have those Q&A sessions uh, scattered around April and May leading up towards the end of the call. And we have that lead applicant webinar week that Petra mentioned. We'll put the links to registration of those in the chat so you can find them there and already save the date and register. Um, now, uh, we also want to share some tips on how to prepare, how to get ready for the call. Before we get to that, I still want to take a few more questions. I'll again let you a little bit of time to think. Uh, post those questions in Slido. We'll pick them up from there. And let's see a few more comments from lead partners of Interreg Europe projects. Uh, it gave us the opportunity to increase our capacity, not only the staff, but also the stakeholders. And it is easier that way to influence our managing authorities in order to improve the policy. So besides the, the policy improvement, uh, participating to an interreg Europe project, open your mind. Through knowledge sharing, through uh, collaborative thinking, and it, it's a program that really offers opportunities for regional and local public authorities to share ideas and experience on public policy in practice. The benefits from the project is really the connections and the network that you will have, uh, that, that is the outcome of these projects. It can help you or it supports the, your daily activities. And you collect a set or you build a network of peers who deal with the same issues in their own regions, in their own countries, and can help you in solving your specific problems in your region. Most important benefits of being part of an Interact Europe project is to get inspiration from other regions which have the same challenges that you have in your region. So knowing what they, what others have done to solve their problems can help you to find your own solution for your region. And I think that it's something very valuable. Yeah, I think that that's the most relevant aspect of European cooperation to, to be inspired and to uh, to see how your ideas could also work in other contexts uh, and vice versa. Really, participate in a, in a, in a European project, in an interreg, your project open your mind and make you better. <laughs> So let's see how we can get you ready to be part of such projects. Um, let's take a couple more questions before sharing some of our tips on how to prepare your application. Eilish, give us a question. Thanks, Mia. So first up for Petra. Um, is the preparation cost for the lead partner only? Um, when you open the application form, you will find out that the preparation cost lump sum is allocated to the lead partner. However, this doesn't mean at all that it's for the lead partner only. 
It's, uh, of course, the preparation of a project shall involve the whole partnership, and it also means that the um, partnership shall decide how this um, preparation cost lump sum is shared among the partners, um, yeah, according to what role they played during the um, preparation phase of the project. So, allocated in the application form to the lead partner, but shared among all of the partners, depending on their involvement. And in any case, I think um, it will be one of the tips we might also mention later on, involve your, all your project partners from the beginning in the preparation of a project and um, it's visible in the end if there is a project that has only been prepared by a lead partner and the um, partners have been added only in the very last minute. It, um, the best way to do it, identify your partners first and then work on the budget. Very good. Um, do we have time for another one, Mia? Yes, let's take another one. Um, we also have a question. Is there a maximum percentage that a pilot action should represent in the overall project budget? Um, there's no percentage because as such the pilot action budget is not um, visible in an isolated way because it's also spread across the different budget lines. I think it's only for external expertise and um, uh, equipment where we can see what amounts are budgeted precisely in relation to a pilot action. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we expect nevertheless this pilot action to um, not to exceed a maximum amount of 120,000 euros. So it's between 40 and 120,000 euros that we estimate pilot actions will take. Let me remind you, the term again has been <laughs> chosen for a good reason. It's a pilot that we want to finance and not the rollout of uh, some policy improvement. All right, and let's take one last one. Okay, and this question is for Nico. Does the lead partner have to be the policy responsible authority? No, 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 the lead partner does not need to be at all. Uh, it's, it's up to the partnership to find the right arrangement. Uh, so there's no obligation for the lead partner to be um, a responsible uh, uh, authority. Yeah. Excellent. As said, the Q&A will continue in the inter Europe corner throughout the afternoon. So do keep those questions coming. We will take the time to answer them. Um, I promised you some tips on how to get ready and how to prepare your application. We've got a few from our side, but if you have any others, if you are already an experienced project partner, do share your tips in the chat as well. Like there's no better moment to share it with the other part participants from all over Europe than right now. So pop that in the chat. Um, Petra, what kind of tips do we have? What can we tell people how to prepare a successful application? Um, I think the first tip I would like to emphasize is um, make use of all the assistance that is offered. Um, you, um, uh, first of all, it starts really download. Um, if you haven't done it yet, do it uh, still today. Um, the application pack, the program manuals, and above all, the manual. Check it carefully. Um, I said it already just a moment ago. Meet your partners, check the common interest, make sure you really um, have the same objectives um, when joining this um, project. And um, yeah, check carefully also the relevance of your idea. Also get back to the JS. We are there to advise you, to give you um, feedback. I think it really starts from there. Um, if your idea is not relevant, then even the best budget will not help. So make sure, first of all, that you have um, a relevant idea. All right, check relevance. Nico, maybe you have one as well. Yes, um, we. I, I don't think this uh, tip will be new, very new for those who know us well, because we sometimes repeat ourselves for many years. But one of the uh, advice we would give, uh, if you have checked through the relevance, you know that Interreg Europe is for you, is then to be uh, as specific as possible uh, in the description of your project. Um, they, they, there's a huge difference in a project that tells us, yes, we will uh, improve entrepreneurship policies. Uh, this we have read it uh, many, many times. We have financed, uh, we have already financed so many projects on entrepreneurship policies. Uh, this is very different from another project who would tell us, uh, well, we are a group of regions um, with a coal mining history. Uh, we went through a very difficult period with coal mining collapsing, and we realized that uh, our uh, unemployment rate of young people is very, very important, very huge, and we need to find new solutions to that, blah, 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 blah. You see, to go in the, in the particularities of the regions, why did you select your, these partners? And this is, of course, also reflected in the description of the policy instrument. So the more specific you will be, the more detailed you will be, 
uh, the more the, the, the project, your project will be unique compared to all the application we receive. So this leads back to the preparation phase because of course you need to have enough time to have access to all this uh, information and details, uh, but this usually makes a difference. Hmm. Luckily the information and details are all already available, so do check our website, go through it, come back to us if you have any questions, we're here to help you. Um, Tip-wise, okay, check relevance, be specific. What else? Nico, third tip. Well, third tip, I would uh, mention be selective. Uh, and what do I mean by that um, is uh, also sometimes we have some tools, you know, to find partners. Mm. And um, you may receive, uh, you as a leader of an ID, you may receive uh, dozens of uh, interested people that wants to join uh, your project ID. We also know uh, on our side, uh, we call them internally the champions, some organization that are in many, many, many projects. Uh, we would advise you to be a bit selective in uh, identifying who are the partners that really share the same need or share my need that can bring something to my project. I can learn from them. Uh, but they can also learn from me. Um, so this is very important to have the right partners around the table. And I would end up perhaps with the most important element for Interreg Europe compared to any other programs is uh, ideally the policy responsible authority should come as a partner, uh, should be the driver of the cooperation. This makes a huge difference uh, for achieving the objective of the project. All right, so be selective. Very good, very concrete. Um, Petra, maybe a last tip or a suggestion from your side. Well, it's maybe a little bit the summary of all of this. Um, I think when, if you are now considering um, to apply to the Interreg Europe program, first of all, think carefully about the project objectives. Define them clearly. Check also if your project objectives, um, uh, if the Interreg Europe program can meet your project objectives objectives. If this is the case, you can take this off. Then you can start planning your activi activities. Um, what kind of activities do you need to achieve the objectives you have previously defined? And then, last but not least, um, you define the budget. So the budget comes after the activities because only then you really know what your project needs and then you can translate it into what it, you expect this to cost. So I think if you follow these three steps, then you should be well prepared to submit a good application. Yes, you should be well prepared. Uh, we have about 10 minutes, a little under 10 minutes left in this session, so it leaves us a little bit of time to cover a few extra questions. As said, we'll continue in the Interact Europe corner in the afternoon, and I'll take you through what else the afternoon holds. But first, um, Eilish, do we still have some questions that we could take here? Yes, indeed, Mia, we still have some questions. Um, one for Nico, perhaps. Do I need to define all of the policies the project will work on beforehand? Is it possible to take a flexible approach to developing the policy work? Uh, this is indeed a, a very important question because if you take any uh, regional development challenges, whether it's uh, environmental, whether it's economic, you have a lot of public intervention uh, in your regions. There's not only one single uh, policy instrument that address uh, uh, traffic in the city, for instance, but uh, when you apply to Interreg Europe, when you call, when you come to a call, you will need at least to specify the main policy instrument on which you, you focus. So there is really uh, an obligation for you to be a bit selective and a bit specific again, uh, because uh, if you are not familiar, you can look at the uh, word version of the application form. You will see that the whole section is uh, dedicated to defining which policy instruments the project would like to improve. Later on in the course of the project implementation, for different reasons, if it's not possible to, to improve the one you have initially identified, there may be, of course, possibilities uh, to uh, improve other public interventions. But uh, you have to, from the start, defining the main policy instruments you'd like to focus on. Excellent. Let's, let's take another question and also let's, uh, let's uh, have a look at Slido later because we want to know if you're ready to apply and uh, give us some input over there. Um, Eilish, back to you. Let's take one more question to one of our speakers. 
Um, this is a question I suppose I can address to both Nico and Petra. Um, a lot of our participants are familiar with the programme from the past period. Would you be able to summarise in a nutshell the main changes um, for those who have been involved in 2014-2020 projects who may have joined us a bit later today? Just a quick summary of what has changed. Shall I stop, Petra? Uh, the, the colleagues will laugh at me because there's an internal expression which is uh, e evolution, not revolution. Uh, so there's a, there's a continuity, I would say, between the previous and the new program. But you have understood that already there is a difference in the topic that are addressed. It's, the game is much more open in a way, uh, because we have presented to you today the sixth topic, which is much more than what we used to do uh, in the past. The second uh, element I would mention, it becomes a bit more technical, but uh, is the new approach to action plan and the two phases. There are more flexibility. Action plan are not anymore the obligatory deliverable that you need to produce at the end. Uh, so it's also hopefully makes the life uh, of the people easier. And uh, the, perhaps the most important uh, evolution is this uh, now compulsory requirement um, to have the policymakers on board as partners. Uh, we, we call it the 50% rule internally. You may remember that we had another 50% rule in the previous program. This was related to the necessity to focus on structural funds, on investment for jobs and growth programs. On this, however, there's more flexibility because it's sufficient if there's only one policy instrument that is an investment for growth and jobs uh, in, the, in the project. So you see, it's a mix between more flexibility uh, on certain features, but also uh, additional requirements on other elements. I think this, uh, Petra, if you want to add, please do. But I think this was a good summary question. So Petra, any final thoughts on this? Um, well, I think on the finance side, um, what is important to mention here, both addressed to those that know the program already, but also for the newcomers, that there is a real effort to simplify, simplify further the financial management with the introduction of this new um, flat rate. The focus should really be on the activities and um, the policy challenges you are facing and not um, the project in itself should become a challenge as such. So really make use of these opportunities offered um, thanks to the uh, flat rate, uh, more standardized staff cost reporting, simplified staff cost reporting. Um, so the control effort has been really tried to lower and even I could talk about it more, but I think in the lead applicant seminars, we will talk about this even more and explain this even further, how the control effort has been further reduced. All right. Um, I can hear a lot of typing. The colleagues behind the scenes are, are busy uh, typing answers to your question and keeping the chat going, which means that you are keeping them busy. So thank you for being so, so very active. That is great. Uh, we are getting very close to the end of this session right here. So we're not going to take any more questions on camera. But as said, you can head over to the expo, to the inter Europe corner, where we will be live for Q&A sessions throughout the afternoon. There is a lot more happening in the expo as well. There are country corners, you can meet our representative, you can meet our points of contact from different uh, countries all across Europe. Go and check those out. The first ones go live at 12.30 right after this session. Uh, in addition to that, there are about 60 project idea booths that you can explore. You can find new project ideas. About 30 of those ideas are also going to be pitched live um, during the afternoon. So check the agenda see which ideas match your interest and, and join those uh, pitch talks for a live discussion and uh, start your next cooperation adventure. So that's what the agenda holds for us for next. So the agenda uh, is really still going to be very, very packed from 12.30 until about 4 in the afternoon. The event itself is far from over, so even though we close the plenary stage very, very soon, you can still continue to network. We will still be there online and uh, we can continue to discuss and make sure that you are ready for the first call for project proposals and you are ready to submit your application. We have a few extra tips that we want to give. Um, here are a few from my colleague Irma. Let's see how we help you to prepare your project. Are you developing an interregional cooperation project? Then let me share with you five practical tips. First, share your project idea on our website and let others know about it. 
It can be a quick and easy way to find potential project partners. Second, check out our community of thousands of policymakers. It can be a great resource for you to find a relevant match for your future project partnership. Third, join our upcoming events to get answers to your questions and even more important, guidance on how to fill in your project application form. Fourth, do not forget to check if your idea fits our program, Interreg Europe, by using our online tools, and you can also ask for feedback about it. Fifth, Interreg Europe Secretariat, myself and my colleagues are here to support you. So good luck with the preparation of your project application. I hope you took note of the tips that we've shared. I hope you're ready now to at least start your application and I hope you're ready to uh, meet other people because the networking is just about to start. We are going to launch one more poll in Slido to get some of your feedback from these morning sessions and uh, to get an idea of uh, what you were maybe missing or what else you might have been looking for or how you found it overall. So do give us some feedback in Slido right now. We are going to close this session and as for many of our events, those of you who have participated before will know there's no better person to have the last word of an event such as Europe Let's Cooperate than our director Irvin Sivers. Before we go to him, I want to thank you on behalf of our entire team for being so active, participating, keeping the chat going, keeping the Slido going, answering to the polls, uh, giving your inputs. Uh, keep it up, keep cooperating. We look forward to receiving your applications. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking part in Europe Let's Cooperate. We're happy to see such a huge interest in our first call for proposals. We've provided you with plenty of information for the project preparation. Now it's time for you to develop your application. Take inspiration from the past projects, the resources provided by the policy learning platform, the online tools and the guidance provided on our website, and remember that my team is available for you to help. We are looking forward to receiving your project proposals and the deadline is 31st of May noon. My team and I wish you good luck.